Hello, this is uh, Shelby Shadwell here for the American, uh, sorry, Wyoming Promise Call. Mary Grant, it looks like you're on the call. Yeah, I am. Am I the only person? <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, thanks for joining us. I think Chris uh, Corfanta up in Sheridan was, was on us, uh, with us there for a second and uh, just jumped off. We're just going to wait for some more folks to uh kind of jump on here, but I thought I'd just go ahead and say, hey, and thanks for being on. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having it. Um, I'm mostly here just to learn stuff, though, so I hope nobody's depending on me for some awesome questions or anything. Oh, no, absolutely. I think uh, this will be a great learning experience for, for all of us, and there's a bunch more people uh, jumping on right now, so I'm uh, just so you know, I'm going to keep everybody uh, muted uh, at first. Um, right now I'm going to unmute uh, Ken Chestek, uh, who's on the call, and uh, Ken's unmuted. And uh, just so you know, you're, you're, uh, everybody's muted at, at the beginning, but if anybody has a question at any time, feel free to press uh, a number on your dial pad and we'll see that your arm is raised and um, we can uh, address your question as soon as possible. But uh, now that we're kind of getting going and a bunch of people are joining, I'm going to uh, see if Ken has anything to say here as, as people continue to join. Thanks, Shelby. Uh, this is Ken, and welcome, everybody. It's still a few minutes before uh, the conference is scheduled to begin, so um, people are joining the call. Uh, we're excited to um, be able to host this call. Um, we're still waiting for Professor Lessig to join, but hopefully he will be here in a moment and we'll be able to get going. Um, and I want to thank everybody uh, who's on the call right now for all the work you've been doing. Um, this is a, a long haul. We're well into the process of gathering our signatures. Everybody on this call has been helping out with that project. Um, and I'm so impressed by the number of people who have stepped up um, to do this hard work. This is grassroots democracy at its finest, and it takes, I think, Shelby and I both, this is the first time we've done anything like this. It's probably true that most, for, the same, for most of you, you've never probably done anything quite like this before because it's an unusual thing we're doing, but it's really important work, and we are so uh, excited to have everybody here, and thank you all for all your efforts. Shelby? Yeah, and, I'll, uh, uh, yeah, and I, I'm definitely going to uh, second that. Uh, as I say to many of you on these conference calls and in person when I can, uh, you're American heroes, and uh, you know if we get this amendment, we're we're all kind of founding fathers in a in a big way. And uh, uh, so so thanks for all your efforts. And and I wanted to just say please keep in touch with us if, and and me in particular if uh, and and Manda still our our statewide field organizer if we can be of any uh, support to you. Um, we, we we always want to uh, reach out, and we're here at the statewide level to to support you. So keep in touch with us uh, when it when it com comes to that, and uh, we're, we're here to to help in that way. So uh, Ken, it looks like we're we've got a lot of folks jo joining, and uh, Professor Lessig might be on at this point. Yes, I see Professor Lessig has just joined the call. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute him, uh, Professor Lessig. Uh, we are still waiting for a few people, people to join the call. What we do is we uh, leave all the microphones unmuted except for a few people. Uh, so you and me and Shelby Shadwell right now are the three microphones that are unmuted. Uh, if anybody uh, who's joined the call has a question, uh, we will get to you uh, later in the call uh, by pressing one on your keypad uh, Shelby and I have a little screen that shows that the hand, your hand has gone up and we'll be able to call on you by name. Um, so just wait a few more minutes um, and uh, I'll introduce Professor Lessig and we'll hear from him for about 15 minutes or so and then uh, take some questions and uh, either questions for him or questions for um, the rest of us as we're working on this uh, very important project here in Wyoming. Yeah, and just to reiterate, um, everybody now uh, who's jumping on the call, and we've got a ton of people on the call, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, everybody's muted right now except for 
uh, myself and Professor Lessig and, and Ken Chestek, and we'll get, uh, we'll get going here uh, soon. Uh, Ken, I'm guessing you're going to introduce Professor Lessig and then uh, let, let him speak, and then we'll, we'll open it up, up for questions and, and go from there. Yeah. Um, in fact, why don't we go ahead and get started uh, with that right now. Um, first of all, again, to everybody who's just jumped on the call, um, I said this earlier, for those of you who just recently arrived, thank you all so much for all the work you're doing. Um, we're doing something unique here in Wyoming. Um, there are five states that have um, called for a, constitution, for a convention of states to propose this amendment, uh, but none have done it by uh, initiative, by voter initiative. Uh, there have been four states that have asked Congress by initiative to do this work, um, but they did not ask for a convention of states, and all four of those states are, or f all five of those states um, are blue states. Um, we're a red state, uh, and we are the, the first state that's really tried to do a, a ballot initiative calling for a convention of states. Um, so we're doing something unique here. Uh, we have a really strong team statewide I think, Shelby, the last time we checked our database, uh, we have 500 people who have volunteered in some way or expressed interest in some way. We have about 200 people right now with petitions out there circulating them. Uh, we need more, um, but uh, we're making some progress, and it's, it's important work, and we're step by step we're going to get there. Uh, it's really our pleasure tonight to uh, welcome one of the pioneers of this work. Uh, Lawrence Lessig, a professor of law at Harvard University, has been working on this for a lot longer than I have, um, and he's um, written books, he's done YouTube, um, TED Talks, um, he's a hero of mine, um, and uh, Professor Lessig actually ran for president uh, in 2016 on this issue, uh, trying to um, highlight the, the fact that money determines who gets to run, and he, he challenged that system and ran for president himself. And I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what Professor Lessig has to say about that experience or basically whatever he wants to talk about. Uh, so, Professor Lessig, uh, welcome to Wyoming, and thank you for all your work over the years. Um, please take it away. So, thank you so much, and, um, and, and thanks for uh, arranging this call. I apologize that I had a problem with my kids last week that forced me to cancel talking last week, but I'm really grateful you were able to reschedule for this week. So there are two things that are really important about what you're doing. Um, first, you're in Wyoming, and second, you're in Wyoming. Um, so the first one is you're in Wyoming, which means you are a red state. Uh, and that's demonstrating something that we've known for many, many years, which is that this issue is not partisan. Uh, Republicans as well as Democrats feel deeply and passionately that their government has been stolen from them by special interests, and those special interests have addicted our legislators to answering whatever call they make because, their leg because our legislators depend so heavily upon them for funding of their campaign. Um, and so the most important message that we can spread to the whole of this country is that Republicans and Democrats and independents alike want a government that represents them. And they don't want a government that's representing the 100,000 people who are funding congressional campaigns. So that's the, that's the really most exciting and incredibly important thing that's going on in your state because um, your state, Montana, has had lots of activism around this, are critical parts to the message we're spreading that this is not a partisan fight. And number two, you're in Montana, which means you are far from the craziness of the place I happen to be tonight, Washington, D.C. Um, and the reason that's so important is that people in Washington have a very narrow view about what's important to Americans. And that, and that view is fed to them by political consultants who have a view about how to run political campaigns. And their view is most Americans don't care about the corruption of their government. They care about you know, whether they get Obamacare or they care about whether they reduce the 
taxes or reduce the debt. They, have, they care about the issues that Washington is supposed to be addressing. But what I think most Americans outside of Washington recognize is that uh, this system here in this city is so fundamentally broken that we have to find a way to bracket our own individual issues. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Democrat. I'm happy to admit and, and acknowledge I'm a Democrat, and I have, I have issues that I care about as a Democrat. But I think what we have to do is to say we need to bracket those issues and those differences that we might have and to focus attention on what we know Americans across the country care about, which is to get their government back. And the only way that happens is if people who are far removed from the uh, distortion field of this city um, take the lead in building activist movements. And, and, and that's, that's the second really important reason why the fact that you're in Wyoming is so critical. Um, you know, now, I've been for many years uh, trying to collaborate and working and talking to people on both sides of the aisle about the importance of the movement to get this kind of reform and to, and to call for a convention of the states. Um, and I've uh, worked closely with uh, um, uh, uh, Mark Meckler, who was one of the founders of the Tea Party Patriots. Um, and I've worked uh, with people from the Wolfpack organization who have been pushing the Money in Politics uh, Convention very strongly. And, and what, I, what I believe uh, I can say with all honesty about these people that I've worked for, with is that all of these people genuinely are in this fight because they're trying to make this democracy a better democracy. We don't have to agree with every issue that they might want to put before America in the form of a constitutional amendment in order to see that they're in this fight because they desperately want to believe that they're giving to their children a better democracy than we have right now. And, and I think what we have to do is develop an ability for people of radically different political views to be able to work together to rise above the partisan divide that is so endemic to American politics today and to, and to signal to the American people that we believe in something more than just Republicans or Democrats or the fight of Republicans or Democrats. Um, and so I think it's a really critical moment in the fight for a convention, for people involved in that fight to begin to talk about how we can reach out to uh, people from all sides to enable them to be part of this movement to propose amendments to our Constitution that uh, Congress can't control. Because as I'm sure most of you know, because you're in this movement, the whole reason the framers gave us the convention alternative is in the case that they worried about, that Congress itself would become a corrupted institution. And whether you're a Republican who cares about the problems of federalism, or a Republican who cares about the problems of the deficit, or a Democrat who cares about the problems of the deficit, or a Democrat who cares, as I do, about the problems of representational integrity, all of those problems flow from the corrupted and flawed Congress, the institutional Congress that we've allowed to develop. And we can't depend on them to fix themselves. I, I, I think that you know, Congress is filled with an extraordinary number of really honorable people who went there for the right reason. But when they get there, they, re, they realize that that institution has been deeply corrupted. And what we need is a way to propose reforms that they can't control. And that's exactly what the convention gives them. Um, now, many of you obviously have been in the middle of this fight, and you know the arguments that people make about the dangers of the convention. And the most uh, common argument that's made by people on the left and by Phyllis, you know, the old Phyllis Schlafly groups and uh, even the, uh, John Birchers on the right um, is that the convention is going to run away. And if it runs away, then it could change the Constitution, because um, that's, in fact, what uh, they say happened at the founding of our Constitution. And I've written many, many pages about just how crazy that fear is, um, that it's not based on historical fact. It's based on a fiction. And it's um, 
it's really dishonest in its characterization of, of what actually happened at the founding of our republic. But I think what's much more important is the way that argument belittles us as citizens in a democracy. Because essentially, you know, I spend my time arguing with liberals, um, and I'm sure the argument exists on the other side as well, but I'll just to report the argument with liberals. Essentially, the argument of the liberals who are opposing the convention, that argument boils down to we can't trust the democratic process to improve or um, repair our Constitution. We have to rely on either the Supreme Court or members of Congress to propose the changes or make the changes that our Constitution needs. And I find it so frustrating and embarrassing to live at a moment in the history of this great democracy where people openly believe that we can't, as a people, rise up to the, uh, the challenge of repairing and insisting on a constitutional value. Um, I reject that position. I believe that the people, if properly informed and engaged in this debate, um, would produce exactly the kind of changes that this Constitution needs. And if we can't, we don't deserve this Constitution. Um, so I think that the movement that you're part of, and I'm incredibly happy to be joined with American Promise in the cross-partisan movement that you're trying to build, to call for reforms, and if the reforms don't happen, to call for a convention, um, is the critical political action that we need to be taking in America today, much more important than whether we elect you know, another Democrat or another Republican in Congress. Those are important issues too. But this really fundamental issue about how we restore a democracy that we can have faith in is a critical fight that um, I am so excited to, to be helping with as much as I can and to be, um, to be supporting in every way that I can. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful, again, to, um, to the uh, organizers in Wyoming and, and uh, American Promise to, for, for inviting me to participate in this. I'm really eager to take questions and to answer any uh, questions you might have about uh, you know, the work that we're doing or how we can help or ideas about how we could make this uh, spread better. But um, let me just stop there and then take whatever questions or suggestions or ideas you might have. Thank you so much, Professor Lessig, and I really appreciate your comment that um, this is um, cross-partisan work. Um, there's really two reasons why I'm involved in this work in Wyoming. Number one is the issue itself. I think um, this is issue zero. There's a lot of problems in this country that need to get fixed, but we can't fix a single one of them until we fix this problem first. So there's that. But the other reason I'm so uh, excited to be doing this work is the cross-partisan nature of it. You're exactly right that we are um, so divided in this country and so polarized that it's that we can't get anything done. And this is an issue that we can agree on across party lines. Uh, I can't tell you how many Republicans we have signing a petition, how many Republicans we have circulating petitions. It's not a Democrat-Republican thing. It's, it's, a, it's a citizenship thing. I'm so excited uh, to be able to um, do this work. So if, whoever, if anybody has a question, please press 1 on your um, keypad. I see Jade Smith's hand is up. So uh, I've unmuted Jade. Uh, Jade, do you have a question for Professor Lessig? Not at this moment. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to figure out to get on the conference call directly. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, R.C. Johnson has his hand up. Okay, it's RC. her hand up. <laughs> I'm sorry. At any rate, yeah. this is my question. If we took a look at the legislation that has been enacted for whatever period of time, would we see a high frequency of legislation enacted in behalf of corporations as opposed to the average uh, person who would not be able to put legislation together unless they had a lot of assistance from attorneys. Would we be able to simplify that system 
and find laws that work in behalf of the average person? It's a great question. Um, and so the answer is absolutely. If you looked at the issues that Congress focused on and the issues that Congress um, actually legislated on, there would be a very tight connection between those issues and the issues the funders of their campaign cared about. I can't remember exactly the year, but there's a really wonderful piece um, uh, by Zach Carter uh, 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 about this. I think it might have been 2011. And basically what he said is, you know, think about the most important issues that uh, the nation faced in the first quarter of 2011. And you know, you could say we were in the middle of a war. We were in the middle of um, a, a great economic uh, depression um, or recession, at least. We were um, uh, still addressing all sorts of issues about Obamacare that we had to address. We had massive unemployment. We had significant issues with mortgage crisis. Um, all of those issues you would have ranked as the most important issues that America faced. And then what they did is they studied what exactly Congress was focused on. And the number one issue that Congress was focused on, the issue that occupied more time on the floor of the House and Senate and in committees than any other issue by far, was the bank swipe fee controversy. Now, you, if you're an ordinary American, you're going to say, what the hell is a bank swipe fee controversy? And what it is is you know, when you use a debit card, um, the amount of money which the bank gets for the use of that debit card is regulated by Congress. And so what this was was a fight about whether that fee would go up or whether that fee would go down. And what this article was so great at doing is that they interviewed you know, members of Congress, and the members of Congress basically said, yeah, you know, we go onto the floor of the House and we dance one way, and then money rains down on us by people, from people who want us to dance the other way. And basically, we dance back and forth because that's the best way to flush money into the system that we need to run for re-election. And that story could be retold a million times. There's an amazing bunch of uh, empirical research now being done to demonstrate that much of the reason why we have the opioid crisis right now is changes in policy about the access to these highly addictive drugs that have been driven by con congressional action. And the congressional action has been driven by extraordinary funding from drug companies to these Congress people. Now, you know, in one part of me says, I kind of get it. You know, these congressmen spend 30 to 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress, dialing for dollars, calling people to raise the money they need. And of course, they don't call people randomly. They're calling the tiniest fraction of the 1%, no more than a 100,000 Americans give the maximum amount to any one congressional candidate uh, in the course of a uh, congressional campaign. So they're spending half their time talking to 100,000 Americans. And as they do that, they learn which ways they've got to bend in order to get the money they need to get back into Congress. And they bend towards the money. And that's what they learn intuitively, whether they know it on their on, on the top of their head or not, they know intuitively what they've got to do to get the money. And that is the essence of the corruption of the system. And until we change that, I completely agree, until we change that, we will not have any sensible policy on issues that Republicans care about or Democrats care about. No sensible policy. The only policy we're going to have is policy that bends to the money, and the money is not the interest of America. Thank you. Um, I I want to remind everybody, if you have a question, you can press 1 on your keypad and we'll see your hand go up. Uh, I have a follow-up question myself, Professor Lessig. Uh, something you said earlier which was intriguing to me, uh, and that is uh, some of the um, arguments I hear from both left and right against having a convention of states to propose an amendment is that the convention is going to run away and Exhibit A is the Convention of 1787, which uh, we at that time we were working under the Articles of Confederation, uh, and there was a convention called, and it's, instead of amending the articles, it ran away and created this new constitution that we're now working under. That's the argument that I hear all the time. What is your response? To, you said that that was historically incorrect. Uh, could you explain yeah. that to us? 
Yeah, it's a really important point um, to understand, although it's a really hard point to explain in a culture where explanations have to be 140 characters long. Um, but so we've got more than 140 characters. Let me just make sure we all understand the history clearly. So you know, in 1787, um, Congress uh, asked some pretty important people to convene a convention in Philadelphia. And the original, reason, the original purpose of that convention, which was suggested from an earlier convention in Annapolis, the original purpose of that convention was to draft amendments to the then existing constitution, which was the Articles of Confederation. And when the framers of our constitution met in Philadelphia, one of the first things they did was to say, look, the Articles of Confederation are broken. They cannot work. And rather than trying to tinker with this broken machine, let's just draft a new constitution. And so they locked the doors, and they shut the windows. And for four months, in secret, they drafted a new constitution. But at the end of that process, they didn't say, this is the Constitution of America. What they said was, we're going to send it to Congress. And we're going to recommend that Congress send this, this, article, this uh, constitution out to the states. And, um, and if nine states ratify it, we're going to recommend that Congress consider this to be the Constitution of the United States. Now, that, the specifics there are really important because the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution that existed before, said that it could only be changed if all of the states agreed to the change. It had to be unanimous. And it wasn't the state conventions. It would be state legislatures. So this was an explicit recommendation that Congress ask for the existing constitution to be amended, to be thrown out and a new one replace it, through a procedure that was not authorized under that original convention. OK, when Congress got that request from the Philadelphia Convention, Congress could have done one of three things. The first thing Congress could have done was to say, OK, you guys have not done what we told you to do. Thank you for your work, but we're just going to tear up you know, what you sent us because you disobeyed our orders. The second thing they could have said is, this is a very interesting constitution, but we can't adopt a new constitution if we don't follow the rules of the old constitution. So we're just going to send this out to the states and say that if 13 states adopt this uh, through their state legislatures, this becomes the constitution. And the third thing that they could do is what, in fact, they did. They could say, OK, the convention says we should send this out to the states. And if nine state conventions adopt it, we'll consider it as adopted by uh, as, a, as the Constitution for those states. Congress chose the third option. And the first point I want you to see here is if there was anybody who ran away, if there was anybody who violated the rules, it wasn't the Philadelphia Convention. Those were people just writing up some ideas for what the government should be. The person who broke the rules was Congress. OK, now that's important because people say that the precedent of 1787 um, is a precedent that, uh, that uh, would carry over today, and that the same things that happened back then could happen today. And that's what I want you to think about. Is it really possible to imagine that Congress could get away with breaking the rules today? Because let's imagine a hypothetical thing. Imagine we had a convention, and the convention proposed changes to deal with the corrupting influence of money in politics. But at the end of the convention, the amendments were sent back. And uh, um, the Speaker of the House took a survey and said, well, I don't think we could get three-fourths of the states to adopt this. So rather than saying three-fourths of the states, what we'll say is that let's have a referendum in 26 states. And if 26 states adopt it by referendum, then it's considered part of the Constitution. Now, what the people who talk about the runaway convention would have you believe is that if Congress said that, if you know, um, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, or if it's a Democrat speaker, Nancy Pelosi, if the Speaker of the House said, if 26 states adopt this by referendum, then it will be part of the Constitution, the people who talk about the runaway convention would have you believe that it would then be part of the Constitution by them just simply announcing a different set of rules will apply. And, and I think that just to describe that, is to recognize how crazy that is. There is no doubt in my mind 
that if the convention came back and said, here are the amendments we want the states to consider, and Congress sent those amendments out and tried to change the rules for adopting those amendments, the Supreme Court would in an instant step in and say, hell no, the Constitution says these amendments are valid only if three-fourths of the states ratify them. And the only way that we will recognize these, these amendments as part of the Constitution is if three-fourths of the states ratify them. Uh, and I think it's, it's practically impossible to imagine in our current political environment that Congress could have the authority to change those rules merely by announcing them as different rules. So this, so this is why I, I listen to these people talk about the danger of a runaway convention. I just don't know what they're talking about. We can't even get a Congress to pass a budget. And the idea that the Congress that can't even pass a budget could come up with a, with, with a, with a resolution that would go against the plain language of the Constitution and anybody would respect it is just crazy talk. So there is, in my view, zero chance that an amendment could be proposed that would not have to be ratified by 38 states, three fourths of the states. And if 38 states have to ratify an amendment, what we know that means is that no crazy right wing or no crazy left wing amendment could ever be part of our Constitution. In fact, in the history of our Constitution, there's only one time where we've ever had a partisan amendment added to our Constitution, and that was the Civil War. Um, and beyond the Civil War, every amendment has always been cross-partisan. And that's exactly what this amendment would have to be. And if it failed the cross-partisan test, it's not going to be part of our Constitution. And so that's why I have no fear about the runaway convention. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any hands up right at the moment. Uh, if anybody has a question for Professor Lessig, uh, Mark Hinckley has raised his hand. Uh, Mark, you are unmuted. All right, thank you. Um, so rather than going to a constitutional convention, I'm sure we're going to get this done, but uh, how do we apply pressure to Congress to do it on their own? Is that the way to handle it? Well, I, I would hope that would be the way to handle it. And historically, the most important role, I mean, as everybody knows, we've never had a convention since 1787. But um, that's not to say the conventions have not been important. Whenever, whenever the states have gotten close to calling for an Article 5 convention, the terror that that has created in Washington has been enough to get Washington to act. So the most important example was the 17th Amendment, which, which made it so that uh, the Senate would be directly elected. That 17th Amendment is part of our Constitution because the states came within one or two states of calling a convention for the purpose of proposing that amendment. And when Congress saw that that was about to happen, they were like, we don't want a convention, so let's just propose this ourselves. So I think, actually, you could, you could be someone who says, I don't want a convention, but still, you should support a convention at least until we're close, because that's the sort of pressure that will actually get Congress to act. Um, so I think that's one type strategy. But, the, but really, the most important different strategy is to get Republicans to talk about this issue. Now, there are a lot of great Republican groups, like um, Take Back Our Republic, um, which is a Republican-driven grassroots organization that's been supporting reform in the space. Um, Richard Painter is one of the uh, founders of that group, and he was George Bush's ethics czar, but he's been a strong supporter of changing the corrupting influence of money in politics. Um, but what's really important is to get more Republicans, especially Republican office holders, to just talk openly about this problem. And, and you know, we've, Republicans have learned that Republicans care about this issue. You know, whatever you think about Donald Trump, when Donald Trump started his campaign, one of the most important things, I think, that rallied people behind him was when he called out other Republicans on that debate stage as being dependent on this big money, and he said he wouldn't be dependent on this big money. And he said we should eliminate super PACs because they were a deep corruption, and he talked about all of these issues in ways 
that we don't typically see national Republican leaders talking about it. And when Donald Trump said that, I got in a lot of trouble because I wrote some pieces saying this is really incredibly important because we will never win on this issue as long as it's viewed as a democratic issue. Uh, and I, so I think that you know, the biggest thing that could be done is if people were to go to um, you know, Republican leaders and ask them to step up and speak the truth. And if Republican leaders, especially coming out of Wyoming, um, were, to, uh, um, were to take on this issue, I think we could begin to get, crack the uh, partisan framing that's around this issue right now. That's a great point. We have actually had, we're fairly lucky in Wyoming, we do have a prominent Republican, former Senator Al Simpson, who has been out front on this issue. He's written op-eds for us. He's been on the radio supporting our he's, – he's given us a statement to put on our website. He's been very vocal in support of this effort, and that has had a lot of clout uh, with a lot of our voters. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, Professor Lessig, but we actually – before we did this effort uh, to go to the voters, we went to the legislature, proposed uh, a bill that did not include the Article 5 convention. It was just a call on Congress. Uh, we got it introduced in the, the, state, the Wyoming legislature. It was adopted or was passed with a due pass recommendation by the Corporations Committee, which was the only vote it got. The, the Speaker of the uh, Wyoming House uh, decided it wasn't a high enough priority for him, so he buried it and it didn't get through. But it was never voted down. It was the only vote it had was a positive vote from a Republican-controlled committee. So we've got some Republican support already for this effort. Uh, and as I said before, we've had a lot of Republicans signing the petition, carrying the petitions around, working with us. Uh, this is clearly a cross-partisan effort. Um, so um, unless there's any final questions for the professor, not seeing any hands. Um, RC has her hand back up. Uh, can you take can you take one more question, Professor Lessig? Of course, yeah. Okay. Actually, there's not two hands up. Uh, RC, what's your question? You're, you're unmuted. RC, are you there? Yes. I'm here. Okay. Okay, okay. You, did, you have your hand up, R.C. What's your question? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you now. Okay. Persons who were confronted about signing the petition saying, well, I've raised a lot of money for my party. She happened to be Republican. And I like corporate money. What is, and this is a grassroots person who has been doing fundraising. What is the appropriate and effective uh, way, because you're not going to change that person's mind, but that person will influence other people. Um, how do we address that particular frame of mind and frame of reference that the party will lose money if they, uh, um, if they eliminate or if they uh, try to yeah, eliminate corporate money? a really great question. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can just describe that this debate uh, about what we should do um, has really two very different camps in it. And one camp, and these are typically the more liberal people, um, is really focused on limiting participation by corporations and by rich people. And so their view is we ought to silence the speech of a bunch of people inside of the political system. Um, and then there's another camp which, um, you know, has both liberals and conservatives. I, I think of myself in this other camp, people like Richard Page are in this other camp. And so we just got to find a different way to fund campaigns so that members of Congress and, and members of state legislature don't have to bend over backwards to please a tiny fraction of the 1% of their uh, district, but instead have to bend over backwards to please a majority in their district. That's what democracy is supposed to be about. And so I think that what we need, uh, what, the most effective thing to respond to that kind of view is to get people to at least see that um, with an alternative system of funding elections, uh, that doesn't benefit liberals necessarily. I mean, one of the 
one of my strongest uh, conservative friends who supports the idea of changing the way we fund elections says, look, if it were easy to fund elections on the Republican side and the Democratic side, most of America is uh, relatively, you know, moderately conservative America. They would support Republicans more. And that might be true. I'm not, I'm not sure whether that's true or not. But what I am sure of is that we've got to have people focus on what the core dynamic of a democracy should be, which is a government responding to the people and not responding to this tiny fraction of the 1%. Madison, when talking about Congress, said Congress would be, quote, dependent on the people alone. And by the people, he went on to say, I mean not the rich more than the poor. But of course, what we've allowed to happen is a government depend to develop that is primarily dependent on the rich more than the poor in order to fund their campaigns. And that is not a representative democracy. And I don't think anybody on the level of principle should defend it. And if they're defending it on the basis of, well, this is the only way our side would win, I think we've got to get them to see how actually fund campaigns differently, and it's not clear which side wins. Hey, thank you. Uh, if you have time, we have one more question, if you have time for it, Professor Lessig. Sure, happy to. Okay, and Chris, Cor Chris Corfanta up in Sheridan. Chris, uh, you are unmuted. Hi, and thank you, Professor Lessig, for talking with us. Um, you mentioned a Tea Party person that you've had conversations with, a Mark Metzler. Could you um, expand on that a bit? Yeah, so Mark Meckler is the founder of the Convention of the States movement, and they've been trying to get, they've gotten, I think it's like 10 states already, but they have a big plan to rally states to call for an Article 5 convention. The purpose of their convention is um, fiscal responsibility and federalism, so shrinking the power of the federal government. And so he's not, he's not been pushing um, uh, to deal with the problem of what I think of as representational integrity or, you know, whether we have a government that's responding to the people. But, uh, but he's very, but what's valuable about those movements is that um, they are very clear. I mean, we, we all agree, but on the left and the right, we all agree about the nature of a convention, the limits on a convention, what a convention is not. Um, you know, an Article 5 convention only has the power to propose amendments. That is not what we lawyers think of as a constitutional convention, because a real constitutional convention can do like our, 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 convention, our first convention did. You can change the rules. But this is not that. This is just about proposing amendments. And so I think what's valuable about these other movements is while we don't yet agree on the, the scope of what the convention should be allowed to talk about, we do agree about what a convention is and what the limits of the power of the convention is. And, um, and, and therefore why there's nothing to fear about what a convention would do. And, and I think that's a really important conversation to encourage because when people are scared, they're looking for, re they're looking for um, reassurance by people on their own side, people in their tribe. And so if you're talking to a conservative, a conservative is not going to listen to a liberal Harvard law professor. A conservative is going to listen to somebody whose values they, they believe they share. And, and so that's why I think having this multitude of perspectives, all arguing that a convention is only to propose amendments. No amendment can be ratified unless 38 states support it. 38 states means no crazy right-wing or left-wing amendment will ever be adopted. So let's try a different way to fix our Constitution than relying on Congress. If many different perspectives say that, then I think eventually people will get it. Thank you so much, Professor Lessig. Um, and I really do appreciate your uh, going a little over the half hour that you had offered us originally, and uh, really appreciate your thoughts. And thank you so much for all your work over the years. Uh, you've been inspiring to all of us. And uh, I think uh, we're going to get it done here in Wyoming. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to get this on our ballot. Uh, the history of these things when they get on the ballot out here, in, in both in Colorado to the south of us and Montana to the north of us, both of those states called on Congress by referendum of the people. They passed by margins of 75 to 25 in both of those states. 
I have no doubt that we will have a similar result when we get ours on the ballot here. So thank you, Professor Lessig. And uh, with that, if there are any questions for uh, either Shelby or me, um, please raise your hand, but uh, please join me in, in thanking Professor Lessig for his insights and for his work over the years. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Professor Lessig. This is Shelby Shadwell, and uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a, a lot of uh, applause uh, out there <laughs> across the state Great. with people on the call. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for that, and uh, uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, I, I think I uh, concur with uh, Ken that uh, we're going to get it done here, and this is cross-partisan, and uh, I think once we get it done here, that's going to open some floodgates for, for a, a lot of other states to, to get it done as well. So thank you, Professor Lessig. Okay, great. And um, I look forward to coming out and celebrating you, with you when you guys get it done. Absolutely. Let's, Love to have you. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions uh, for us? And I see Chris Corfanta has her hand up. Uh, Chris, you are unmuted. Hi, um, I have two. Um, this, these are a couple of questions that came up just recently. Um, people are wondering, uh, will the signatures be public record after they are uh, given to the uh, Secretary of State? I believe the answer is yes. Okay. And then the other question is if we do not get the required number of signatures by the deadline, will the ones we gather still be valid for a longer time? Yes, they will. Um, we actually have two deadlines. They're alternative deadlines. Uh, if we can get enough signatures by the beginning of February 2018, and that's coming up pretty quick, uh, we'll be able to get on the 2018 uh, general election ballot in November. If we don't have enough signatures by February of 2018, we can still continue. We actually have 18 months from last May in which to gather these signatures. So we can go 18 months from last May will take us through next fall, the fall of 2018, and we can continue gathering signatures, uh, and then we submit them, and uh, that would put us on the ballot for November 2020. And also all the work we're doing now would continue on. We'd, all the signatures would still be valid for that later effort. Um, we're hoping to, to make the 2018 deadline. It's a push. We have a lot of work to do to get to 2018. Uh, but if we don't get there, uh, we are gathering steam. We've, we're adding capacity every week. We're adding new circulators. We've got some new teams going in new counties. Uh, so things are picking up speed. Um, if they pick up speed fast enough, we might get there by February of 2018, and that's our goal. Um, but if we, if we miss that goal, we're not dead. We still have all that work, and then we just have to go through and finish up uh, next spring and summer. And I have no doubt. There's uh, literally no doubt whatsoever that we're going to get there at least by the 2020 deadline. Uh, but I, I'm hoping to get there sooner. Thank you for that question. Okay, are there any other questions for the group? I'm not seeing any hands go up. So there, wait a second, somebody put their hands up. Um, Desiree, uh, Desiree uh, Allred, you are unmuted. Hi, Ken, um, we're just getting started here in Uinta County. And I was looking to maybe write a letter to the editor or announce something in our local newspaper. Just wondering if anybody else had done that or had any examples of, of that. Um, yes, Shelby, you want to talk about um, the um, volunteer resources page on our website? Absolutely. Uh, so. Yes, uh, we, we do have a, uh, a sample press release, uh, statewide or, or national press release. It actually isn't on our volunteer resources uh, page of our website, but um, those of you that uh, don't have access necessarily to our shared 
County Team Leader folder and would like that information, please just email me or info at wyomingpromise.org and we will get you uh, any kind of uh, those samples uh, that, that you would like. Um, and that can be a great tool that you can take and you can uh, make uh, uh, tailored to your county. Because this is a county-by-county county effort, really, just like the national effort is a state-by-state state effort. And so you know better than anyone else those folks in your county. And um, so we'll make sure to get that. We might even uh, – we can probably post that to the Volunteer Resources tab on our website, uh, a sample press release. Right now we've kept it uh, uh, a little less uh, public, but um, just email me if anybody wants a sample. Uh, press release uh, for your local paper, and those do a huge amount of of, of work, uh, and 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 get out to a lot of folks. And uh, so so just contact me uh, if if you would would like that. There are a ton of resources on our volunteer resources uh, tab on our website, though. All the uh, uh, arguments about Article Five and the fear of a runaway convention. We have talking points about that. And as well as a, a, a ton of other things. So just uh, keep in touch and, and email me um, and, and reach out to me, and I'll, I'll get anything I can to you. What, else, what has also helped in some counties, um, the newspapers have published the op-ed that Al Simpson wrote. Uh, that has been very effective. Um, and it's been published in four or five or six different papers around the state, and usually whenever that gets published, we get volunteers right away. Um, so uh, we can get that, the Al Simpson op-ed to you, and you can submit that to the paper. And if they want to uh, talk with, uh, with Al or Senator Simpson, I have contact information. They can verify that with, uh, with him that, that he wants to have this published. So that's also been very effective. And we do have both of uh, his statements uh, on on the volunteer resources tab on the website, um, so you can you can uh, view those there and download them and and do what you what you will. Right. Okay. Lois Peterson has her hand up. Lois, you are unmuted. Yes, I was just going to mention that um, we are trying to get an article in the paper here. I did talk to um, our state. Representative uh, Mike Madden, he's he's uh, in favor of this. He said he would write something and put it, um, you know, and talk to the paper about it, and uh, might even might even come on to the radio with us. So um, I thought that was a really good thing. So yeah, I think writing the the article in the paper is a really good idea because it does inform people um, in a large number of people all at once, so that you don't have so much instruction to do when you go door to door or, or team meetings or whatever else you do. Right, and, and here is Buffalo, correct? That's right. Yes, and you're, uh, one of our newer teams is getting going in, in Johnson County. We really appreciate your efforts up there. Um, and I see Mart Hinckley has his hand up again. Uh, Mart, what is your question? You are unmuted. Well, I, I was on the website today, and I noticed that several counties have uh, contact information on your website. Yes. Hours on there, put put our collectors on there, and, and get it's it's a good reference point. You can send people to Wyoming Promise, and maybe they can get back to us. That's right, Mark. What county are you, are you in, Mark? Is Mark? Are you with us, Mark? Okay, I'm not hearing Mart again. I was hoping to find out what county he's in. Um, uh, yeah, our, uh, on our website, we do have a where to sign tab. And um, that is really important. If you are uh, a team leader in your county or you know a team leader in your county, um, we, we've really been trying to get folks to uh, either uh, uh, get a, a – an individual email address or contact information on there so that folks, when they go to the website, when they figure this out, when they read an article in their, in their local paper, um, they can go to the website and be like, oh, well, this is where I can sign a petition or this is who I can contact to sign a petition. Um, there is, we, we've had a lot of success with folks um, uh, having a local business 
owner uh, have a petition available. Uh, they need to be a circulator and and uh, approved by us. But uh, if if there is a local business in your in your town or county, um, let us know and we'll put it on the where to sign tab on our page. And so that folks, if they're just new to this issue and they care about it, they can look it up and and directly go to the where to sign thing and say, hey, this is my county. This is where I can sign a petition. And that's what I want to do. So uh, let us know. Email us. Um, I put out many calls to, to, to folks, especially county team leaders for that. But uh, we, we have everybody on this call. <laughs> so if you know of a local business that, that cares about this, and they should because small business owners can get drowned out by, you know, larger businesses because of the problem of money in politics, uh, let me know, and uh, 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 we'd be happy to have circulators and local businesses in your county and get them on the website and, um, and, and get folks uh, uh, to those businesses to sign the petition. Okay, good. So Jade Smith has her hand up. Jade, you are unmuted. Okay, thanks. Hi. Well, first to answer, Mart is from Bighorn County, <laughs> and so am I. Um, we were carrying along the vein of, of advertiser articles of newspapers. We just had a nice article come out uh, where our editor at the Grable Standard interviewed both a Republican uh, and a Democrat about the importance of it. We have gotten a couple more Democrat or Republicans on board now, and we've gone from uh, eight to a, next week we'll have eleven of us out there as circulators, so uh, we're pleased about that. But the article was really, you know, if, if we can get a, a bipartisan um, group of people, it's going to make uh, people think a lot more. And I've heard quite a bit of talk about the article, and, oh, there was an article about this. So it is bringing awareness, and I, uh, th I would urge people to see if their editor would do something like that, if you can find someone from both parties that would be willing to be interviewed by your by your local newspaper that might might help boost it a little bit thank you for that um, and we we actually fe featured that article we linked to it on our Facebook page so if you get articles published in your newspapers locally let us know uh, and we'll link yeah. to them on the Facebook page so we can uh, get more publicity and spread the word even farther. Uh, the Facebook page is doing pretty well. We have, I think, 400 likes around the state so far. Uh, so right. and that's probably every county has people uh, now liking our page. So uh, that's another great way to get the word out. So let us know when you have successes like that. We need to celebrate uh, all the successes that we can come up with. So and just to add... Uh, Shelby, to add to that, um, if you like our page on Facebook, you can post uh, directly to that and we'll approve it and put it on the page. Or uh, a lot of folks around the state in, in counties have, have started their own Facebook page as well. And uh, I end up uh, liking those and then sharing those with the statewide network. So it's a great way to keep in touch uh, if you want to start your own Facebook page or if you're inclined to do that. Uh, and and it it does help, and it it we we we've actually had a ton of of new likes and and Facebook uh, activity uh, here recently. So I mean, it does make a difference if if that's something you're interested in starting or doing for your county. Okay, are there any other questions at all? I don't see any hands up at the moment. So somebody's uh, RC has her hand up again. RC, you're unmuted. I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Lessing mentioned his YouTube um, presentation. Is that something that is on the website that can be accessed, or even suggest that people refer to it? Because it seems that his passion in presenting uh, the counter argument to the runaway convention fear is vital. Yes. Um, I, I forget, uh, Shelby, what do, I, 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 do I think we have a, a link to an article. I'm not sure we have. Uh, Shelby, what, what do we have? Uh, I, we can't put more up there, but what do we have right now from Professor Legs on the website? 
Yes, uh, so we don't have a lot on the website per se, but we will we will add more in the email uh, for this conference call. I sent a couple of links, uh, very important links and and great links uh, to uh, two interviews or, or not one not two interviews, but one TED talk that Professor Lessig had given. Uh, that really shows the need um, for for this reform, uh, and also a, a more recent interview that was done with him. Th those are only two links, uh, and they are in the email that we sent out for this conference call, uh, just so that folks could uh, uh, watch those and get uh, in introduced to Professor Lessig and what he's done. Um, one is his TED Talk, and the other is an interview with uh, Jenk Uger, who's the founder of Wolfpack, another group that Professor Lessig mentioned that is uh, very uh, uh, involved in getting uh, uh, pushing for the Article 5 uh, uh, convention. Uh, and so check that email again, and you should be able to get to those links. We will post links uh, to that on our website. I think we can definitely do that ASAP. And I will do a follow-up email to this conference call with more links and more information um, and, I, 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 and anything else we can think of to, to, to post to get you as much information as possible. We do have a link on the website under volunteer resources. Um, his article on um, what was it, Ken? The uh, the article or the the writing he posted based on. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, that's what I was just going to say. I just checked the website. We do have on uh, under the volunteer resources tab. Uh, there's a section on that page called Article Five Limited Convention of States Information. The next to last item on that is a chapter of a book he wrote called Republic Lost. It's chapter 13, and we've posted that. It's a discussion of why a runaway convention is not going to happen. It's crazy, and here's why we shouldn't be afraid of it. So that is on our website uh, right now. You can go look at it. Uh, our website's back up. I don't know if you saw my post on Facebook. Uh, we've had some, some bandwidth issues on the website where – Every so often, it's unavailable. We're not quite sure what's going on with that, but it's available right now. So please feel free to go out to the website and look for Professor Lessig's Chapter 13 of Republic Lost. We've posted it with his permission uh, to the website. So are there any other questions? Unmuted our uh, statewide field organizer, Amanda Still. Hey, y'all. I just wanted to mention that you mentioned uh, you said the website was going down and we weren't quite sure why that is. I just wanted to mention that the reason that we're having a bandwidth issue, issue is actually because we're experiencing a, a surge in activity on the site. So there are more people who are going to the site, checking it out, and interacting with the links. Um, and every time they do so, every time a new person joins the site, or not joins the site, but um, checks it out, um, they increase increase the use of our bandwidth. So when we have those times where the site shuts down because we don't have bandwidth, it's actually it's frustrating for sure, but it's actually for a good reason because it means that there are more people who are engaging in the site and who are um, picking it up for the first time. Um, so I just wanted to offer that. Um, uh, Chris Bell, who works with Ella, has updated our bandwidth to 10 gigabytes. So we shouldn't have that um, problem in the future. We were at 5 before, then he upped it to 6, and now he's upped it to 10. So we shouldn't experience that same problem anytime soon, but I just want to put it out there that that's actually a good thing. It means we're having more increased activity, and it means more people are, are turned on to our site. So um, I just wanted to offer that explanation. That's great news. The alternative was that we're being hacked, which is a different kind of news that people are worried about us, but that's not the case, fortunately. So that's great news. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, uh, I just want to say one last time, thank you all so much. Oops, we had, uh, Chris Carfanta, um, just raise your hand. Chris, you're unmuted. Hi. Um, I was checking out, um, well, there's an outfit called Citizens United that you might get the junk mail from or something on um, your email, and it's not, I'm, I started studying it a little bit more, 
And it's actually not really working on ending Citizens United. They're actually gathering money for Democratic candidates. And it's kind of working against our issues because some people think they're giving money to end Citizens United, which is what we're trying to do. And so it's, it's getting to be um, maybe working against us. And I just wanted to put that out there. Have you guys um, been um, familiar with that issue? I have not seen that one. Um, I know there's a lot of disinformation out there. That's not one that I'm familiar with. Um, the one that bothers me is you, I'm seeing it on Facebook. Is there's a sign our petition, end Citizens United, sign our petition, uh, and people they click that and they sign and they think they've signed our petition. And of course, that's an online petition is not our petition at all. You can't sign our petition online. If you are canvassing and somebody says, yeah, I signed that petition online, your answer is no, you didn't, because it's illegal. We can't do that online. It's got to be face-to-face. -face. So the online petitions, uh, they're not intending to hurt us, but they're not helping us either. So uh, sure, go ahead and sign it. It's meaningless. Uh, it's mostly an, an effort by people to gather your contact information. It's not really doing any good. Um, the only thing that does any good is to go find one of our one of you guys who's got a petition and, and have them sign it in ink uh, in front of you on the official piece of paper that the Secretary of State has handed us. So, any other questions, comments? Shelby, some last words. Well, I would I would second that. I would say that uh, definitely make sure that that folks know, uh, yeah, sign in person, sign on one of our official petitions. That's democracy. That's signing in ink. And um, again, I'll 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 echo what what I kind of said at the the beginning. I mean, by getting this amendment, we are in a lot of ways founding fathers. And I just cannot thank you all enough <laughs> for everything you're doing. And uh, again, contact myself, Manda Still, or or Ken anytime you need anything at all, and we will we will get on it and we'll do whatever we can for you. Democracy is not easy. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a hard thing and it's a roller coaster, and we get good weeks and we get bad weeks, and and things go up and down. But the main thing is to remember you're you're not sitting on the couch. Everybody on this call is not sitting on the couch, and you should be proud of that. And uh, you should take that on to the next level, and we're going to win this. So uh, uh, keep in touch with us, and thank you for all you do. Ken, do you have any last words? Nope. I just echo what you said. Thank you all so much for your work. And we, got, we still have a lot of work ahead of us, but I have no doubt we're going to get there. So keep up the good work, and uh, pay attention for emails. We'll hopefully have some more of these calls with – Additional speakers coming up soon. Talk to you, and we'll hope to see everybody uh, out on the streets. Bye bye. Thank everybody. you so much. Bye bye.
You are currently the only person in this conference.